And this is time now for our very last guest. He's a world-renowned Italian architect and designer. He's a bridge between disciplines. He won eight times the Golden Compass Awards, among other awards. He has worked on worldwide projects as architects, such as airports, office buildings, or residential buildings and museums, like the National Gallery of Victoria, Melbourne, Australia, just to give you one. From 1985 to 1991, he edited Domus magazine, one of the most internationally recognized publications in the design field. The MoMA in New York dedicated him a personal retrospective in 1987, and we are thrilled to have him here today with us. Please welcome Mario Bellini. Thank you. I still remember when years ago I was very emotional to, to say something in public and so I have written a very beautiful story and then I started reading it and it was very cold, very, it was a kind of disaster but it, it went off and, and I said I promised myself never do it again, you know, never, never and I'm here now reading you uh, <laughs> a short text because I'm be I've been asked uh, a few months ago to write something about future, or this monster, you know, the future, uh, the house, the future, how we will <coughs> live in the future, and so and so. And it was a book, and so I had to write a nice story about uh, future. And it went off quite well, and I tried to say something provocative, uh, talking about future. So I would like now to read you this, but it's not too long. Um, to say that there is no future without uh, a very good, uh, thick past. And, uh, and then I'll show you uh, some of a series of, uh, let's say, uh, visionary masters which have started a century ago uh, thinking about the future, because we, we cannot discuss about future without knowing what happened already in that uh, very field. And, uh, and then I will let you see few, very few of my things uh, with a comparison between <coughs> something I have designed and what could have been the, at the base of that way of designing things, referring to our so old and r uh, deeply rooted past because we are living as human beings in home and houses on this earth since centuries and millennia. And so we cannot invent a chair, you know? Who invented the chair? Think about it. And, um, and so that's to tell you wha what, what will happen. I'll try <coughs> to see, to, to go quite uh, fast. Let me read this text, which I promised uh, to do, not to do once again. <coughs> On uh, <coughs> 24th of August, 79 AD, Anno Domini, at around 1 p.m., Mount Vesuvius exploded unexpectedly. The eruption overwhelmed all the inhabitants of Pompeii and the surrounding areas. It buried their homes, their decorations and splendid frescoes, their furnishing, their carpets, mosaics, statues, fountains, kitchens, Ovens, sinks, cutlery, pottery, triclinia curtains, clothes, impluvia doors, stairs, windows, roofs, gutters, beds, chairs, pillows, porters, cupboards, silverware, footwear, bathrooms, latrines, uh, uh, lamps, scrolls, jewelry, mirrors, working animals, and pet as well. <coughs> it buries street, portico, shops, squares, market, roofs, uh, temples and public buildings of Pompeii and Herculaneum. It, bar it buried everything for years until the excavation campaigns and uh, unearthed an, an astonishing vision of, of a civilization that was still practically intact. But uh, today, we have no ideas whether 
the people of ancient Rome enjoyed predicting the future of uh, humanity and uh, especially future lifestyles. They didn't think about that. And then we will see it is something which is practiced uh, since no more than one century. And so when we talk about future, we should also think about this, because also the future has got its past. I mean, uh, being worried about the future has got a past. Not so long, but at least one century. But one thing is sure, the long roster of objects that were buried does not contain a single term or circumstance that isn't already still familiar to us in the area of the so-called Western culture. And this immediately puts everything in a new perspective, because uh, leaving aside the less substantial matters, this would almost did, uh, this is, uh, be like saying that almost 2,000 years later, all of us today live in the same way. And so I, I'm contradicting this uh, big worrying about the future, but I'm doing it in a dialectical way, of course. But that's to say that there is no future without past. And when, when we, we make the we design a sofa for the future, you should imagine how much history is behind the concept of a sofa, which goes back to the Turkish Empire, because the D1 was the room where the government was guiding the, all the laws and, and, the, and the public rules in the, in the country, and they used to stay on a carpet with big cushion. That was the room of that, the no name of this room was D1, the for, out of which we say Divano, for example, in Italian. Huh? And so beware of this. And the ability you have when you design anything derives from the fact you are cultivated. You, you have in your mind, in your past, all these things, all these straight uh, layers of lives and lives and lives and living and living, which makes you conscious and able to do something you believe to be a little bit looking to the future. So that said, <laughs> I will now, using this object, <laughs> which is already out of place, uh, put, put it on, yeah, on, on the zero position, because this is already advanced. Okay, this is an image that I like to use whenever uh, possible to say, let's see, look at this, at this image. This is the Villa Stein of Le Corbusier, 1927. What a modern house, still so modern that is considered future futuristic, because very few houses has got this strong modernity inside. And he has taken this picture together with the car, which was modern, was the expression of the progress. Look at the contrast. That is an old, rusted object we, we can even not understand, and that is still a modern house. That means that what, uh, whatever is linked to, our, to the continuity of our uh, material culture as living human being has got a such a long and slow continuity which builds layer over layer uh, the, the so-called progress. Yeah. You know that the concept of progress is getting old. Uh, it is wrong, it's outmoded. You know. While uh, with machines, every five years, uh, they change. They go on and on and on and on, and they are much, much weaker under the, this point of view. Okay, that is, is was a, a statement. And then about the visionary uh, masters, uh, I think I can stay here, and it works better. Yes, I know. 
Uh, one, of, one of them is uh, Sant'Elia, which is an Italian, and he started imagining uh, our towns being heroically futuristic, and he made such beautiful drawings, you know them through books, and then th there is always somebody today, contemporary, who makes a, a render of it to make it <laughs> more real. That is another one of uh, the uh, true uh, Saint Elia drawings, and another render made by, by somebody, you know. Uh, it was called the Città Nuova, you know, new city. And uh, this is um, Harvey Willie Cour Courbet. He imagined New York to be designed like this, to uh, separate uh, pedestrian traffic from cars and connecting buildings and making bridges. And it was not so far away, a little bit uh, exaggerated, a little bit exalted exalted by, by, you know, the idea of the future. But in fact, if you consider the subway, <laughs> more or less, w uh, New York is working like this. And then Fritz Lang, you know, the famous uh, filmmaker, uh, imagining uh, Metropolis in 1927, which was uh, also linked about uh, this heroic idea of the, the city of the future, where everything was connected, new, modern. And again, uh, the <coughs> their, uh, uh, Eric uh, Kettlehunt, Kettlehunt is, was the, how do you say, the scenographer for them. He imagined for New York something like this, and in fact, you, you we don't know who, who started first imagining this. <laughs> and then now we see uh, movies with uh, the most strange things, uh, even James Bond, you know. Uh, so look at, again, uh, Fritz Lang uh, with uh, this uh, sketch for Metropolis. There is a, um, a robo which is connected with a real man and they're trying to make something and let that one becoming with the capability of the human being and moving around and so uh, there are still uh, ideas around. And then uh, Le Grand Maître Le Corbusier, uh, which uh, he has been one of the greatest architect and artist and, and thinker uh, of our world, but my God, can you imagine to destroy such a portion of Paris to make bam, 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 those buildings just <laughs> close to the, uh, uh, the, the Lille, uh, Lille de France and so and so? It, it's unbelievable, but he was looking for the future and he got such a strong idea in his mind and he, he didn't care about it. Of course, he couldn't do it because <laughs> they would have killed him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that his engine was the future, you know, uh, again. Then uh, he, he was uh, unsatisfied and, and he said, uh, why don't... He, he tried another time. Yes, fi five years later, La Ville Radieuse. <laughs> La Ville Radieuse again and uh, for Paris. And he said, why don't we do this piece of town? Look at how rational it is, how functional, how modern. Can you imagine Paris with this thing inside? No, nobody would, get, would, 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 uh, would, would go there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> then he tried in a more <laughs> uh, flexible way, in a, in, in a weaker uh, condition. And, uh, and uh, he tried with Rio de Janeiro. You know? They said, you can do this, that, that, that. It's a long street which actually is uh, with a uh, housing underneath between the columns. That could be done, but can you imagine what a social life can people have there? Nothing, you know? They're, they're, uh, they're, 
uh, kilometer number 25 of the street, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it, he didn't, he didn't uh, stop. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then uh, le plan obus for Alger. Most of these places are places where I have been uh, and I visited almost what I'm talking about, you know. And uh, again, there is a street long, long with this big uh, snakes, uh, habitative snakes, but Alger is uh, the Casbah, is much better, is much living, is much full of life, you know. And finally, he started thinking, started from, from the man, from the human being, and the les unités d'habitation qu'il a imaginé. Uh, you, you find them in Berlin, in Marseille, and, and some, some places around. And uh, I mean, in terms of being able to set up an uh, urban scenario, they are rather too authoritative. Uh, no, you cannot make a, let's say, a district of many of these. But if you consider the way the ideology which is behind this, this uh, kind of big buildings, Unité d'Habitation, uh, has been able to, starting from the man, to change the idea of the interior human space. Because, in fact, uh, this is a very livable kind of idea. You have uh, this is the back, but on the other side you have double double height, the living room. You have a mezzanine, you know. You have the kitchen. So it, it's this is really a proposal for a way of living, which is which was innovative and still works around. There are a lot of uh, contemporary houses uh, set up uh, with this idea of uh, three-dimensional space. Uh, this is the the side where you have the double height light. Then, okay, there is the sun axis and everything, you know, all these stories and so on. A little bit uh, hygienically sustained, which I find a little bit uh, bah. <laughs> Look at the chairs. <laughs> I don't know where, where they come from, uh, anyhow. <laughs> then another, another uh, big visionary figure, Louis Kahn, which was a very respected, uh, great architect. He came to my architecture faculty and uh, gave us a lesson. A lesson. I, I still remember in that uh, step-down big uh, uh, aula, how do you say? Aula. Ho. Oh. We had this man illustrating all these things. He was emotional. And uh, his plan, <coughs> no, he's, uh, we are not, uh, sorry, we are not uh, yet in Louis Kahn. This is Chandigarh again, which the, the last things uh, I'm showing you about uh, Le Corbusier. And this, this time has worked. I've been there a couple of times, because I've been many times uh, in India. I'm sorry, I'm impeaching you to see. I made a three, four, five uh, long, long visit trip in India. And, uh, you know, w it's so difficult to design a city. No? You, you, you settle a city, but a city, no city can be designed by a single human being because they are stratified and set up layer by layer through history, through wars, revolutions, uh, uh, happy moment, economical possibilities, and then they became the living concrete book of the history of a population. In this case, when you design a town, the so-called so -called ideal city, uh, they are normally a failure. Most of them failed. They are empty, uh, visited by tourists no? a as a moment of a human being. This works. And I've been recently there, and they are going on using and occupying the portion, and they are full of life. But maybe it, it went coinciding well with the Indian way of life, you know. Uh, here we are. 
again, for Chandiga, this is the, the public building, you know, uh, for, 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 for the full city. And this was taken when it was not yet developed, developed and is settled. But it is an interesting building. Uh, look here. This is the entrance of the public uh, building, which I think is the mm, communal building, you know. You see there are little things there. Okay. <laughs> One question is, when you open the windows, how prevent you from falling down? <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> but these are anyhow uh, t taming the light and taking care of not uh, uh, having too much direct sun coming into uh, your, your life, you know. Now, uh, there is uh, Louis Kahn. I've been there a couple of times. And first, I made a, a conclusion. All what has been built by Le Cor uh, Fra Louis Kahn is, is still well maintained, perfect. Because he has been using the brick. The brick has got such a long tradition, it's something human. There are things you cannot do with the brick, and so it is preventing you for inventing, from inventing strange uh, formal things, wi because with the concrete you can pour it and make any shape. But unfortunately, I I in India mainly, where the way of construction was not so controllable, and where the maintenance is equal to zero, all the Corbusier buildings are almost disrupted, gone with, with steel outside, uh, the concrete getting powder and so on. So I think it will be ve very probably impossible to restore unless uh, you spend a lot of money. While uh, Louis Kahn is still perfect. Uh, this is something to remember. You know? Uh, this is the big uh, public library, and those are those are the houses uh, for the people working on the, on the library. Uh, I couldn't enter and see how the interior of their, those houses with those with those halls is working, but I'm I'm curious. But I can show you at least uh, a house. Uh, this is, uh, let's say, uh, it's the interiors of uh, Escherich House, which is a private house designed by, by um, uh, Louis Kahn. And then I've been so pleased to see that he has got this chair, as I do, <laughs> which are the, <laughs> the, come si chiamano, non è che me le dimentico, Cherner, the Cherner chairs, which are beautiful objects. And very probably this is the uh, Charles Sims uh, uh, relax uh, uh, chair, easy chair. And this is a very <laughs> interesting kitchen with a, such a free flow things. And then with this <laughs> pathetic <laughs> cooker. <laughs> uh, and and that, that is interesting, you know, there is a double height, you see. Uh, and is this immersion surrounded all by the green. And so that means that Louis Kahn has been working and dedicating himself to the way of living at home, which is the, the subject we are, we are here for. You know. Then there is another visionary man, and I, know, I knew him because he, he died. I've been there to visit his uh, foolish, uh, how do you say, utopia and dream. He, I don't know, they, some, somebody gave him a piece of land uh, in, the, in the Arizona, in the desert, and uh, he called the city where he was working uh, Arcosanti, which comes from arcology. His, the his theory was we are consuming, eating too much soil of our, in our world, so why don't we instead build 
such a, I say, monstrous uh, macro uh, buildings with a lot of family things, uh, lift, uh, move, uh, people mover, and so and so, to concentrate uh, uh, the dealing with water, with, uh, with uh, how do you say, the remainings and so on, eh? the waste and so and so, which was not a stupid idea on itself. And some of the photo you, you find here, a photo I have taken during my long, one of my long trips in, in the States. And here is uh, Paolo Soleri he illustrating his project. And his idea has been to settle there and to build a city full of these uh, mega structures. Uh, some of them were the kind of br big bridges, uh, big uh, towers, and so and so. And the idea has been to hire as workers students, which when there, the students were obliged to build their own concrete boxes to, to settle and also to cultivate, uh, um, can we say, uh, orto, a vegetable garden to, to, to eat something. And so it was a kind of uh, community which was uh, free. And, and they started building. When I arrived there by chance, <sighs> it was a Sunday, there was a big uh, kind of, uh, how do you say, festa party celebrating the first bridge, which was a piece of one of those uh, gigantic complex, which is this one. And I said, oh my god, <laughs> five lives w will not be enough to, 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 to do. In fact, uh, he went on and on to sustain himself. They were casting some little bells, and they gave the bells, they sold the bell to the tourists, and so and so and so. But it has been an experience, anyhow. And th that is to say that gener uh, generation before us, they were all thinking about the future, you know? Uh, this is a model of uh, Paolo Soleri, one of his uh, complex uh, uh, mega buildings, and so on. No? Then here we are, we are, we are, uh, uh, I think this is jo uh, Jona Friedman, which is another thinker, which, who imagined this, uh, <laughs> to, to make a dense uh, habitative context in order to burn less part of the earth, you know. Uh, one question, how can it stay there? But then there was another gentleman, which is Moshe Safti, which kind of disappeared uh, slowly then, which was very popular during the Montreal uh, World, uh, uh, World uh, exactly, uh, 1967. I went there expressly to see everything, and this is much later when it started. <laughs> started uh, going. It, my question is, you, you got those big windows. If you open that, <laughs> wh where do you go? <laughs> and so it is, it's a, there's a bit of terror some, somewhere here and there, but it's a mass of people staying all together. And uh, that was called uh, Habitat, no? Habitat 67. Staying together, which I suspect a very little uh, common life, you know, very little social life. So it's, it's a paradox, you know, all together, but not really. What's this? <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, here we are. Uh, at the point of, uh, you know, moving cities. You remember the metabolists, no? They made this. And uh, I suspected all those lines, they're row of living spaces, you know? So you can imagine. 
And they imagine a uh, city moving and going here and there, staying together, then separating. And uh, you can imagine this is uh, in New York, I suspect. Eh? Near New York. <laughs> here there is a, a monster invasion <laughs> which <laughs> Uh, coming, uh, and those are big apartments, uh, towers, conical, you know. Uh, and these are all apartments, and these are maybe big uh, gla glazed uh, spaces. Uh, and so, but anyhow, it was all they were all putting themselves the same question we are putting uh, us now, you know. This is the same story, but in the desert. That was in the water. Yeah. Cities moving. Okay. And then uh, well, I was preparing this in, in my office. Somebody who is an uh, expert of that side and also uh, passionate with that side said, don't, don't forget the movies. I said, oh, you're right. <laughs> you're right. And there is this uh, uh, sci-fi, you know, psych fiction. Which, I don't know, is there, and it could be considered uh, an exercise about a possible reality, but anyhow, something given to us to make us think about. You know. This is Blade Runner, the famous, this is the first of the series. You remember, this is a huge uh, screen. And there is a kind of uh, desperate, uh, tragic idea about what's going on in our world. And uh, it's trying to prefigure uh, a disaster, a kind of disaster. You know. And then there is another series of this kind, which is called Doctor Strange. I don't know if he, any of you have seen one of these movies. Uh, this is based on the principle that one could uh, take off his mind from his body, and because of the huge of connection and interconnection we are now able to, to enjoy or to, or, or, to, or to detest or to have, his mind uh, could uh, have a reality vision. This, for example, is three times the same things, and there are fractals which move and multiply themselves, creating the illusion of a space which is, uh, let's say, a suggestion. Eh? And uh, uh, this is Elysium, is another story of this kind, which where uh, the inhabitants, uh, as a kind of lost any any hope to be able to go on man maintaining the world as it is, because it, it goes uh, uh, broke. Uh, uh, there are a lot of waste, uh, and so. And it's no, no more possible to go on this way. That multiply people is multiplying themselves and so on. And so they imagine to, to abstract themselves from this world and create a kind of super world for, for the ones who, who can do it, which is over there, you see? And they use then the present earth as the discharging place for, for their wa waste. And so, uh, this is it. And then Akira is a, is a Japanese uh, cartoon by Kazuhiro Otama, Otoma, uh, which also, no, uh, to, to to uh, imagine this kind of catastrophic future becoming all mixed up and so and so. 
And then we are doing uh, even worse. To <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> there is something which having a decent kind of uh, urban environment of this, put these uh, uh, monsters inside like that, which reminds me, you know those animals which suck your, your, your blood? Uh -oh. <laughs> They're awful. Uh, how, how can they imagine to go on? Is, it, is that future or is it suicide, you know? <laughs> In Baku, no? But that, that is the oil money which makes uh, the, the, the ruler becoming crazy, you know? Okay. Uh, Dubai. Uh, uh, now there is a little rumor about there. I've been there tens of times uh, here and there, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, etc. because we were predicted to design a mega structure for the World Football Championship 1922, which is not yet vanished, but if they go on like this, they won't be ready. And then there have been scandals, you know, about uh, the FIFA, FIA, uh, FIA, FA, and they thought to build this floating island as an habitative district with that hot water, that misty uh, vapor, and, and a little bit smelly, <laughs> and so hot. But that it became uh, an exercise to invest money for stupid people from all over the, the, <laughs> the world. Then they discovered that it was impossible to live there, there is no sense, and then th there's been a kind of uh, falling down of the values. And most of them, they let there what they have paid as an uh, anticipation advance payment, and they, whoosh, they flew away with the airport and they uh, disappeared. And most of these places are di inhabited. You know. And even, even uh, this is uh, again Dubai, and they go on. Look at, and then it's a kind of uh, race to do it strange. Uh, in Rome, they say "famolo strano." <laughs> and there is this, uh, 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 let you say, uh, kind of uh, defile of, of strange uh, towers. Uh, which also are used not mostly for people going there, living uh, or, or uh, as office or houses. They are uh, good to invest money on the, on the idea that every year it grows very much until when <laughs> everything explodes. I found in, in Beijing a new district, big district, designed by uh, Gregotti Associate, which is a good office, which is now closed. And it got a very nice atmosphere with canal, houses, etc., etc. And I went to the place where you can buy apartments in there, and I said, can I buy something just to, to inform myself? And they said, no, sh no, sir, it's everything sold. I said, but there is no one living there. They're all desert. I only saw a cat. <laughs> and I saw some, already some, can you say crepa, when something <coughs> cracks, some crack in the building, because they're possibly going down, because if, if nobody maintains them, again, it was a story of investment. Then, uh, I mean, I, I normally I would have brought all my works here, showing them. I've done it hundreds, no, well, something less hundreds of times. But I said, we are talking about futures. Let's uh, get a little bit fun, you know, discussing uh, wh when happened this, you know. Uh, this is possibly, I don't know, in, in China somewhere, you know, this hanging pot with, with a fireplace. And this is one of the archetypes, not the fire at, at home. Uh, now is this. <laughs> Which is horrible, horrifying. Uh, no, wait a moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, 77, I designed the chair 
uh, which is called the cab, which you, you see how it works, no? Oh, leather, uh, uh, sh a small, uh, a small uh, steel, steel frame put dressed on it. Uh, it became so successful, they, they built already 700,000. They sell it all, all over in the world. But I said, nobody invented the chair. And when you design a chair, you are putting yourself in a flow, which is a chair makes a chair, a chair, a chair, a chair. And this is actually the chair of uh, Senedjed, uh, dignitary of Pharaoh Seti the first. <laughs> 19th dynasty. No, I can't remember the dynasty. <laughs> but look at this chair. This chair is exactly our chair. They knew already. L look at the architecture, the engineering of it. The structure here is a, is a frame. Uh, this is a, a spherical bend. This is cylindrical bend, slanted. No, they knew it already. What, what, uh, what an interesting story. I, I didn't see it before. When I wanted to dis uh, describe my chair, I tried to find some archetypes of, of this idea, because it's easier. You, you show this and that, and people understand better. Huh? This, again, is a chair done with uh, flexible panels I have designed, all flexible, done with a, a self-skinning polyurethane injection, which is a new technology came out in, in the middle of the 70s, and they made it. But then you look back, uh, it was already there. <laughs> this is a stone cathedra, medieval. Only a little bit heavier, a little bit uh, <laughs> less comfortable. No, but it's the archetype is there, you know. Uh, uh. Uh, I also, I happen to, to give a, be, be a consultant for Olivetti for years designing all the new machines after the electromechanical era, all the one electronics. And I so I had to invent uh, archetypes, because they didn't exist before. And this is a very popular now, it's a sh of course, uh, it's, it's old, but uh, calculating machine with a printing unit and so. But then I made these photos, and I remembered that. This is in, in Palermo, in a, in a museum. No, in Palermo, in, Messi uh, in Palermo uh, Antonello da Messina, which is a, an extraordinary Renaissance painter. Look at this. The relationship between the human being and, and the object, this is about reading, also about writing, could be. Eh? Eh? It's something which is magic. It, it has got something, um, let's say, sacred in a way. Uh, but when you design a machine, you have to understand that behind. Otherwise, you just uh, fulfill functions in a stupid way. You know. uh, then uh, the in, a, in a morning, I remember I designed a few tables for, for Casina. It was a very productive morning. Uh. One of them was, uh, ah, take some cylinder, and piece of wood, put that. Boom, boom, uh, it came out this uh, <laughs> table called Colonnato, which is round, rectangular, square, etc., etc., with three columns. Eh? And, and uh, it doesn't need any attachment, any gluing, because you put this bomb, it stays there. <laughs> and people say, oh, it throws down your, your uh, pavement. Eh? You, you no, we said, because uh, they surcharge per square meter is so and so, and that is much lesser than people staying in that same area. And so, in fact, uh, n never, never happened something. And this is, is still popular, and I called it colonnato. Right? Uh, and we, we got, of, of course, uh, our fathers. This is a huge building I have designed uh, in Milano. Uh, 1997, and just to tell you, it started 85 because it, it's a long project. It's a huge building. It's longer half a mile, you know. And it's a fair, the Milano fair, before they moved it out, out to the city. Uh, and uh, then I thought that the reference for it is a is a city because it's a, it's a wall. This is uh, um, Montagnana near Padova. 
uh, which is a 14th century uh, city. Uh, look at these signs, this wall, you know. Uh, this is uh, the, the famous uh, Piazza delle Erbe in Verona, you know, with this beautiful shape, uh, with you know, the market. Erbe is vegetables. You know? yeah. And then when I had to design the, uh, something in Frankfurt, I made the same shape, I put uh, the umbrella, etc., uh, etc. Et then they didn't build it because uh, doing being an architect is dangerous. I, I'm out of time. And so, uh, this, uh, I designed this, remembering this. I was there. Eh? All the places I'm quoting, quoting are places I, I personally saw and visited. This is in Tokyo, the capsule hotel, uh, where the manager living, going to Tokyo for work from their home by train, then they stay longer in those uh, uh, equivocal bar and, and, and places, and they, they are so late and they lose the train. And then they go sleeping here in this unbelievable place. It's a kind of, a, let's say, bar. How is it a bar? A caffeine, yeah, yes. And then you go there and you sleep a little bit if you can because they have drunk too much. And, <laughs> and then they take the first train in the morning and they go home saying, I'm sorry, I was out for work. <laughs> uh, you, you understand better here. This is a lamp I have invented, very simple uh, with a reference, or a table. Uh, this table has got many legs, and uh, there is the one with two, with three, with four, and so on and so on. It is called the basilica. But a table is not a functional object. A, a table is also full of meanings. You know, this is the Last Supper, or you can sign a treaty of peace, or you know, whatever, or it's an altar for a sacrifice of uh, Abraham, and so on, you know. And so when you design a table, it's a table. It's not a raised floor. Or when you, again, when you use wood, even wood has got a culture, his own culture, you know. This is also very popular. They've done a lot of this. Uh, this is the, the big uh, b building you've seen for the fair with the uh, Russian avant-garde presidents. This is in Tokyo. The Tokyo Design Center and this stepping down because you cannot project uh, shadow, you cannot do this, you cannot do that, and so on in Tokyo. And all this constraint makes your architecture me more expressive. And then you can remember the temple of uh, Hatshepsut uh, in, in Deir al Bahari in Egypt. Uh, the dynasty is the 18th dynasty. Uh, it was already done, including the pyramid, which is you know, on the head of my buildings. I didn't know, but then I found it. <laughs> uh, and this is the, the last uh, few images, just to tell. We are now investigating about uh, how would uh, modify our way of living, uh, staying in uh, high density and high cost metropolitan areas. This is a research uh, carried uh, owned by the, M uh, the MIT, uh, with professor and so and so, which we are studying and, and uh, trying to implement, have a look, but then you can go and, and Google it and, and, and study. It's very interesting. Because normally, when you have a regular house, you have half of the house you use it uh, in, in the day and half during the night. And so you need double space. But if you move things in the same way, you can live that space during the night and that space during the day, and it's half the cost and half the space. And you can do it with home automation as well. I go fast because I'm already red in punishment area. <laughs> you see, you know, uh, turning. Even, even uh, um, IKEA has now designed uh, one of these things, which are the transformable uh, um, furniture, no? that which are all segmented and, and uh, you see, sliding rail system, you move them here and there, and then uh, uh, 
this also. This is Madrid. Somebody used this concept, you know, moving down the space during the night, during the day. Or, or you turn it. Or you see, you can you can imagine briefly. And, and then with automation, they you can also do this. You do this with hands, it it moves. You do this, it it moves, and so. Uh, this is happening, eh? Smart house, micro living, etc., etc. Just to tell you, we are aware of this, <laughs> and we are considering. Eh? And now, we. Oh, finito. Available on market. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mario Bellini. Would you come just a second with me? Okay. This is the punishment zone. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so we have understood there's no future without past. This we got. And then I have this question. I know it's a bit like I'm, I'm kind of half joking, but still, we don't invent anything. Design